All right. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Jamie Debach, and I am the Will County Director for the Conservation Foundation. Um, Conservation Foundation is a fantastic organization. We're a nonprofit, and I will tell you a little bit more of that. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen right now because I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to be talking along with you. So instead of staring at my face, you can look at some lovely pictures of native plants. So do that, and then I share that. And there we go. All right, now you can all see my introductory slide there with my name, my email address, my phone number is on there, but that's my desk line and I'm working from home for now. So email is the best way to get a hold of me. Please feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, again, I'm the Will County Director. So if you are located in Will County, Illinois, then you contact me. And once we are kind of up and going again, I do yard visits. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but I am more than happy to help you with any of your native plant needs. So just drop me an email. If you are outside of Will County, drop me an email anyway. I can put you in touch with the right people. Uh, the Conservation Foundation, we cover Kane, Kendall, DuPage, and Will Counties. We have somebody helping people in all of those areas. Outside of those areas, we have some franchisees. Some organizations have franchised with us for the Conservation at Home program and we can put you in touch with the right person there. And if you're outside of Illinois, um, we have a couple of franchises outside of Illinois, but um, I'd be happy to find your local land trust and put you in touch with them as well. All right, so our mission at the Conservation Foundation is to improve the health of our communities by preserving and restoring natural areas and open space, protecting rivers and watersheds, and promoting stewardship of our environment. Basically, healthy people, need healthy land and healthy water. And we are also accredited, as you can see down there. I know it does mean a lot to most people, but believe me when I say it is a big deal. A lot goes into that. It says that we're fiscally responsible and ethical conduct and all that kind of good stuff. So um, we're doing things right according to the governing bodies of land trusts. I love this map. This map is so cool. If you take a look on there, you can see every one of those dots is a piece of property that we have helped to protect over 35,000 acres, 200 parcels, 43 conservation easements in seven different counties. So even though Ken, Kendall, and DuPage and Will are our four main counties, we do a little work, as you can see in DeKalb and LaSalle, a little bit in Grundy. I'm actually working on a really cool project in Grundy right now. So we kind of do work all over. Any place that we can help, we want to. So why is it important to protect open space it's preserving our quality of life. So we're preserving our water quality, which is our drinking water. It improves our air quality, wildlife habitat. It's good for kids and it, it's just good for us. Studies have shown spending time outside is important for us as human beings. Um, it helps to reduce our stress. It helps us mentally, it helps us physically, and it's just healthier. So especially in times like this where everybody's stress is high and we're having to stay home, being able to be outside is super important. So make sure you're spending time outside. I know it's supposed to rain this afternoon, but right now it looks nice. So um, hopefully you're getting to spend some time outside. So I'm gonna talk a lot about native plants and why, what's, what's the difference? A lot of people think, you know, all plants are plants are plants, who cares? Well, native plants are better for our birds and our butterflies, first of all. It's their familiar food sources, right? It's like going to your favorite restaurant and you know what's to eat there, you know what you like to eat, you can find your favorite on the menu and get going. When we introduce plants from other areas of the country, other countries, other continents, our native birds maybe don't know what to do with them. Our native insects don't know what to do with them. Um, a lot of insects, their mouths and the, the flower parts, I compare them to a lock and a key. So that flower, those reproductive parts of the flower are like the lock. And the insect mouth parts are very specifically form, uh, formed to fit into the, um, to get the nectar out. If you change that lock too much, the key no longer fits. So 
even with native ours, where they've taken native plants and changed them to have bigger flowers, double flowers, different colors, things like that, they lose that familiarity for the insects and so they don't really work anymore. So sticking with native plants um, is much more beneficial for our native insects and birds and butterflies and all that kind of good stuff. It also saves us time and money because native plants are used to being here. We don't have to baby them. We don't have to uh, fool them into thinking they're back home, which means using less water, less fertilizers and other chemicals to try and keep them healthy because they're used to it here, right? They don't mind our heavy clay soils. They don't mind our wet springs and our dry summers and our cold, sometimes absolutely frigid winters. Not that we had much of one this year, but you get the picture. So they're used to all of that. They're fine. So middle of summer when it, there's drought and you're having to water your lawn and all of that, native plants don't care. Their roots are deep enough that they're getting their water from deeper down in the soil. So they're fine. And native plants also help to clean up our environment. A lot of times they will actually remove toxins from the soil. So things like um, oils and grease from roads, um, the fertilizers we dump on our lawns as they wash into waterways. If we have a buffer of native plants, those plants will actually help to soak those up and keep them out of our water. So native plants are actually really, really beneficial and that's why we're talking about them so much. So I mentioned that their roots are super long. I love this chart because there's a great comparison here. Um, if you take a look on the left-hand side, you see the, some of the common non-native species that we see in our landscaping versus some very similar species that we have on the right-hand side. So for example, Kentucky bluegrass, what we ha mostly have in our lawn, those roots are only about two to three inches deep. Fun fact, Kentucky bluegrass isn't actually native to Illinois nor is it native to Kentucky or really anywhere else in the United States. It's actually native to the Middle East, which makes sense when you realize it has that shallow net-like root system that's perfect for holding onto sandy soils. That is not what we have here. It is not happy here. That's why we have to spend so much time dumping fertilizers on it, watering it in the summer, taking care of it, because those top two to three inches of soil just really dry out early on. Um, Whereas if we were to replace it with something like buffalo grass, the roots on buffalo grass, as you can see, go down really far. So uh, that's meters, the gauge on the side there, so two and a half meters. Um, so the roots on buffalo grass go really deep. It stays green all summer long without any additional water once it gets established. Same thing with prairie drop seed, as opposed to the perennial fountain grass that you see there. Roots on these plants go down 10, sometimes 15 feet. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily advise putting big blue stem, a great big patch of that in your front yard, but along a fence, somewhere where you don't mind having a grass that's six feet tall. Um, it's, a, it's a great plant, very hardy, very easy um, to keep growing here because this is where it wants to be. All right, I love this image. It's kind of a tale of two cities here. On the left-hand side, okay, you got an oak tree, that's good. You have your random rock that was probably dug up when they were uh, moving the earth and making the trail and stuff like that. And you have your brown grass. On the right-hand side, they've terraced it because obviously it's on a hill there and they wanted to make sure that we can take advantage of the water that falls and not just have it roll right off. So by terracing it and then adding all those native plants there, that helps to conserve the water that does fall so that it waters the plants that are there and doesn't just roll right off into whatever the nearest body of water is. So you can see, in addition to being all green compared to the brown grass, there's also lots of flowers blooming in there. I'm gonna guess this picture was taken in July because um, we've got our, that bright orange is butterfly weed. So a big favorite of monarch butterflies. We also have cone flowers in there too. Those purple cone flowers are great plants, very pretty. Um, as well as, I don't know, I see some, looks like maybe prairie dock or um, compass plant in there, several others, but that whole swath over there is native and look how great it's doing. So native plants can help you to make your landscape functional and keep it going when 
there's the drought. Also, geese love mowed grass. Everybody knows around here all the problems that we have with geese. And, um, you know, if you've got a body of water in your neighborhood or something like that, you know you've seen tons of geese there, um, especially if it's being mowed right down to the edge. Geese want to be able to walk in and walk out of the water. And they also want to be able to see 360 degrees around them, make sure there isn't like a coyote hiding in the grass or something like that. So they love these golf course type ponds where you've got uh, grass right up to the edge, no plants hanging around there. That's perfect habitat for them. So that's why we have all these geese and trying to chase them out is kind of pointless because more are just gonna come in because they see that that's exactly where they wanna be. As opposed to something like this. So take a pond like we saw previously and surround it with native plants. Now, not only is it much prettier because we've got all these bright, pretty flowers growing around it, but there's less erosion on the shoreline. Um, and the geese are gonna hate this because these plants, even growing up three feet, they can't see coming out of the water. They're gonna go someplace else. So that is not the kind of habitat they want. And look at all the great flowers that are in here, right? We've got uh, Coreopsis and we've got some Ohio horse mint, um, wild bergamot, you know, lots of really great flowers in there. We've got some uh, arrowroot or uh, yeah, arrow had this guy right here. Uh, this guy likes to grow right actually in the water. So they go right on the edge of the water. Um, they want to have their roots sitting in water. So that's a great plant to put at the edge of a pond. Again, kind of a side by side comparison here. Take a look at that turf grass short line. Um, we've got lots of erosion going on there. That tree is not going to be happy for very long. Um, you've got algae along the edge there and that just looks terrible. But when we plant it up with some nice flowers and native grasses and things like that, that's going to hold all that soil in place. I kind of comp uh, compare it to a game of Plinko. Remember that game where you got all the pegs and then you drop the token in the top and the token just kind of bounces down and falls into a slot. On the left hand side, we have that game of Plinko minus all the pegs. So as water flows across the surface of the grass, it's got nothing to really stand in its way. So it's going to move fast. It's going to be high energy and fast moving high energy water droplets are going to pick up soil particles and wash them into the pond. So that also in, um, increases the sedimentation in your ponds as well. Whereas when you have those plants along the edge, now you've got that real game of Plinko where each plant is acting as one of those pegs to slow down the water, absorb some of that energy, get the water to absorb into the ground even before it gets to the pond, um, and just slow it down so that there's no erosion. In addition to that, you've also got those long roots that are helping to hold that soil in place too. This is kind of an interesting spot here too. This was um, a park district had this little triangle originally planted in grass and they had to bring a mower out every week or so when they would mow just to mow that little patch. Super waste of time. So we encourage them to put a tree in there, plant some native flowers now as the bicyclists and joggers go uh, go past, you know, they've got some pretty flowers to see, uh, probably lots of butterflies hanging out in there, and they don't have to mow it. So it's actually saving them time and money on mowing. So one of the questions I get a lot is, well, I don't want to put in native plants. I don't want to put in a pollinator garden because I'm allergic to bees or I don't want to, I don't want bees to be there. So there's a big difference between our native pollinators and the ones that are more likely to sting you. There are three to 4,000 species of native bees here in Illinois. So honeybees actually aren't one of them. Honeybees aren't introduced species. They're from Europe. Mostly, uh, most of the honeybees that beekeepers get around here are Italian honeybees. Um, so they're not native, but they're still good pollinators and they give us honey. So we kind of give them a pass on that. Um, yellow jackets, on the other hand, are the ones that are more likely to sting you. Honeybees and other types of native bees, if they even have stingers, which I'll, some of them don't even have stingers, um, their stinger is barbed like a fish hook. So if it, if it stings you, it's going to leave that hook behind. And as it flies away, part of its abdomen is literally going to rip off. That bee is dead. 
it knows that. It doesn't want to sting you except as a last resort. So you really have to be threatening it, stepping on it, um, trying to grab it, you know, threatening its hive, trying to get into the hive or something like that before they're going to sting you. Yellow jackets, on the other hand, their stingers are more like a hypodermic needle. They can sting you over and over and over and over and fly away and go on to live another day. On top of that, they're usually, I don't know, I find them to be fairly bad tempered, especially in the fall. Um, it's like they're going to die and they know it. So they just become big jerks and they stink because they're in a bad mood. But yellow jackets are actually carnivorous. They're a type of wasp. They don't care about your native plants. They're off to get uh, protein and salts and things like that, they don't care about your plants. It's the bees and the, the other types of native pollinators that are going to be the ones going after your native plants. So don't worry about planting flowers and native plants and bringing in more things to sting you because it's just not true. So you are going to start here for native plants or you can start here. These are a lot of really good um, starter plants. So we've got things in our milkweed family over there on the far right. That is a swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed is a great plant. It grows up, I say, um, I usually say about hip height. So it's got beautiful purple flowers on it. And being in the Asclepius family, it is something that the monarch butterflies need for reproduction. So that's what mama monarch is gonna lay her eggs on. Um, any of the, there are, I've heard anywhere from seven to 35 different species of milkweeds um, here in Illinois. Uh, swamp milkweed, like I said, is a nice one because it's nice and tall. If you want something shorter, we have butterfly weed, which is that orange one from before. Same kind of flower, but it's bright orange and it only grows maybe knee high. Uh, but again, monarchs love it. It's great nectar flower and it's also their host plant, which means it's what they lay their eggs on and what their caterpillars eat. It's the only thing their caterpillars will eat. Um, asters are a great plant because they're a fall bloomer. So everybody's looking for some color in the fall when other things are starting to die out. Um, and it's a great nectar plant for insects like the monarchs that are migrating. So it makes one of those great last food sources for them. So asters are something really nice to put in your garden as well. Black-eyed Susans, very, very striking flower. Again, a great nectar plant for a lot of different things. Golden rods, I'd be careful with. Um, some types are better than others. Some types can get a little bit weedy. Um, they're more of a good, maybe backyard plant, something that could um, get a little bit taller, maybe look a little bit more out of control. Um, not so much for your front yard. Um, oaks are a fabulous native tree to put in. There are tons of different species. They are not as slow growing as you think they are, um, but very hardy. These five genus here, so plants that fall into these five families, support 75% of the native insect species in Northern Illinois. So just these five genus, it's crazy. Most insects are very specific as to what plants they will lay their eggs on. Um, but you know, oaks, hundreds, there's hundreds of insects that will use oak trees. Um, and you may hear me talking about this and, and get kind of concerned that, oh, does this mean my plants are all going to get eaten by bugs? Not really. So studies have shown that native insects will do about 20% damage to a, a tree or a plant. Um, and that most people consider acceptable damage up to about 50%. So the damage that they're doing to the trees as they're eating them, because they, you know, everybody's got to eat, um, is really far below what we would consider damage to the point where we need to take care of it. Um, now, the things that are doing the most damage tend to be the non-native insects. So things like our emerald ash borer, um, you know, terrible, highly destructive, highly destructive insect, but it's not native here. It was introduced. Same with Japanese beetles, obviously introduced species. They're going to do a lot more damage, but they're going to, they're doing more damage because they don't belong here. They don't have the predators and the things to keep them in check like our native insects do. So don't worry about damage being caused by insects. That's really what we want. That's how we're supporting these pollinators. We're giving them stuff to eat. So they're eating the nectar. They may also be nibbling on the leaves here and there, 
but not to the point where it's going to cause a massive amount of damage. So I'm also not saying that I you didn't get that. Could you try again? Sorry, my stupid watch there. Um, so I'm not saying that you have to turn your backyard into prairie. Nobody's saying you have to convert all your landscaping, get rid of all your grass, turn it all into native plants. I mean, if you want to do that, let's do it, but you don't have to. Really, it's very easy just to substitute some of your existing beds with native plants. So instead of putting in pansies or geraniums or something like that, that you have to replant every year, you can put in something like your butterfly weed or at the top left there, that coreopsis, gorgeous. Coreopsis is one of my favorites. Bright, bright yellow plants, really very pretty. Uh, there's yarrow up there on the top right. Yarrow is another one that's got really, it's got really cool leaves too. It's, they remind me of lace. So they, they've got these very delicate lacy green leaves along with those little tiny uh, white flowers. They're great. Blazing star is another one. Very, very striking plant that's down there in the lower left. Um, in the center is cardinal flower. If you've got a wetter area, cardinal flower just loves to uh, have wet feet. They, they, if you can get it, if you can get it in a spot where it's happy, it's gorgeous. It can be a little hard to grow though. It's kind of hard to find that happy spot for it. But man, when it is happy, it's gorgeous. And then down there in the lower right is a little shrub we have called spice bush. That's a really fun one. There's actually a spice bush swallowtail butterfly that's really, really nice. And it's perfect. Um, obviously, it's the host plant for that butterfly. So again, if you want to bring more butterflies to your yard, this, these are the things that you want to plant. So all of these plants support butterflies. And the cool thing is, I hadn't really thought about this. They said, well, they support birds. And you think about it and like, okay, yeah, you see finches eating the seeds on the cone flowers and things like that. But really more than that, the birds want to eat the caterpillars. So caterpillars are like little chicken nuggets and birds need lots of caterpillars to feed their baby because they're high energy, high protein, all the nutrients that those young birds need. So uh, mom and dad birds are going around looking for caterpillars to feed to the babies. No matter if they're seed eaters later on, caterpillars are a huge food source for baby birds. So by planting native plants, by bringing in those native insects, you then bring in the things that eat the native insects like those birds. So another aspect too is you want to manage your storm water. So when water falls, we tend to think of it kind of as a waste product, something to be gathered up and pushed off into the nearest waterway as quickly as possible so we don't have flooding in our basements and things like that. The thing is, our grandparents and our great-grandparents knew that water is actually a, a limited resource and it's something that we need to take care of. So when you're planting all these native plants and putting these things, um, you know, maybe you plant a garden, maybe this year uh, with everything going on, you decide this is the year you're going to start a garden. Um, having water to water all those plants in, you don't want to use your, your home softened water or whatever. Rainwater is much healthier for those plants. It's got more nutrients and things like that in it as well. So rainwater is perfect for that. So using something like a rain barrel, like you see over on the left, is a great way to trap the water that's coming off your roof. And rather than shoving it out into our storm sewers, holding on to it so that we can use it. So you can use it to water your house plants. You can use it to water your landscaping. Um, any window boxes you have or hanging baskets, use it to wash your dog, wash your car, whatever, just don't drink it. Um, but rain barrels are a great way to help conserve water for when you need it. Now on the right, you see a picture of a rain garden. Um, little PSA, make sure it's legal for you to do this. I know it's not everywhere, but I thought this was a super cool idea for this homeowner who had a depression. There's a um, culvert kind of right there. And that area of his yard was just always standing water. It was wet, it was muddy, it was impossible to mow. And I know a lot of people seem to have these kinds of areas in their yard. It's a very common complaint that we hear 
put a rain garden there. Don't fight mother nature. You're not going to win. So you dig it out a little bit more. You plant plants in there that like wet, that like to be in those wet areas. And not even everything in here is native. You can see some hostas and some lilies and things like that, but there's enough native plants that are in there. Those deep roots help to open up channels for the water to go down deeper into the soil and uh, make it so that that area is much more attractive and not just kind of a wet, muddy mess anymore. So our conservation at home program, uh, we've got, I think we're over a thousand certified properties at this point. Um, but through this program, you, this is like I said, you give me a call, I will come out, I will walk around your yard with you and discuss native plants. We can figure out what could go where. Uh, if you've got problems in your yard, like I said, uh, you got wet areas or um, maybe you've got super shady areas that you can't get the grass to grow, um, things like that. We can talk about what native plants would be good for those areas. And maybe you've already got your yard full of native plants. I saw at least one of you on here said your yard's already full of native plants. If you are not certified, give me a call and we can get you certified. Once you get certified, you become a part of our conservation at home family. We have a Facebook group that you can join, which is great because it fills your page with lovely pictures of flowers and things. And then you get a little sign for your yard, like the one um, that you can see right here. And that little sign then uh, just tells everybody, tells your neighbors that, hey, I know what I'm doing. All right, I know at least one of you will recognize this picture. Thanks, Dad. Um, as I said, I'm not, there are lots of different ways to landscape. You know, there are, there are hundreds of different models of landscaping and not everybody's going to like every model. Um, some people like the, as we call it, native but neat. So you've got your little clusters of plants um, and you've got your edging looking really nice there. And I know this has filled in a lot more since I took this picture, but I thought this was really a, a nice example of a neat looking garden, um, very much like you would see your traditional uh, with all of your, your exotic plants in it and things. Um, but still, the, these are mostly native plants right here. You can see the butterfly weed, very, very attractive. Um, the other one is, it's a type of poppy, mallow, something called wine cups that's really pretty. Uh, but again, another native, and then, you know, you've got some native drop seed in there, some grasses, um, a native nut tree, um, just lots of really great natives. And like I said, perfect for a front yard there. Some people like the wild and free look. So um, I, I generally recommend this more for a backyard, um, but you know, I think this looks fantastic. Some people don't think it looks a little messy or something, but I think it looks fantastic. Um, you've got your clusters of plants, all different things growing in there. Um, and it really uh, supports a lot of different types of plants. The plants do better when they have a little more competition in there with each other. Uh, and the birds and, and your pollinators will love it. Conservation at work is another side of the program. So that's basically for non-residential properties. So your schools and churches, um, businesses, municipal buildings, things like that is our conservation at work program. You can see here's a list of some of our more notable conservation at work properties there, um, including Governor State University, all the Will County Forest Preserve facilities. I think we finally got them all certified. Um, several hospitals, Morton Arboretum, Cantini, Shedd Aquarium. It's fantastic. So this is another project that I think is really cool. So this was a library, I believe in Aurora, and they did some renovation on the library and they put this sort of like glass rotunda sort of looking area in there and they put some chairs in front of the windows and they couldn't figure out why nobody wanted to sit in the chairs. It's like, well, who wants to look at that? So we helped them with their landscaping. Look what it turned into. Gorgeous. Now, all of a sudden, they can't keep people out of the chairs. Like there's a line to use the chairs because there are so many birds fluttering around through there and butterflies and lots of insect activity and interest. So um, now this is really a place of, of natural inspiration for people. 
you know, and then you've got your industrial areas. So this, they've got to mow it once a week. It kind of looks terrible, but thanks to Piso, they put in some native plants in here and now they mow it once or twice a year and that's it. So imagine the amount of money that they're saving now because they don't have to spend time mowing and taking care of grass that is non-productive and boring. So now this area is more productive, it's better for the wildlife. And you know, if I was an employee trying to drive in and out of work every day, I would much rather see that. So as I mentioned, I am the Will County Director. So what are we doing here in Will County? Well, one of the biggest things is our Prairie Park Restoration Project. So Prairie Park in Frankfurt uh, is the downtown area across the street from Bright Earth Green. There's some nice walking trails in there. Um, it's actually stormwater retention. I've been told that it captures the stormwater that used to flood the intersection of routes 30 and 45 for a long time. And so they rerouted they uh, through something i don't know the engineering behind it but they rerouted that water now into this big pond and it's got the beautiful walking trails around it they put native plants in originally and then stopped maintaining it as we all know when you stop maintaining areas like that they eventually turn to weeds so um, for the last couple of years we've been working with the village to get all the weeds out of there and bring all of the natives back and it is starting to look fantastic. I gotta say it's really really wonderful when I see people out there walking shooting their family photos um, you know on this area that's that's been restored and looks just so much nicer now. Um, we've also been helping homeowners associations care for their ponds. I've done a lot of consultations with homeowners associations and presented on proper pond maintenance and care. Uh, as well as helping residents make better landscaping choices through our Conservation at Home program. If you are interested in getting involved with the Conservation Foundation, you can become a member. So if you go to our website, which is theconservationfoundation.org, we have some pretty obvious buttons on there that you can click to donate and uh, become a member that way. Um, so if we're doing these webinars for free, so we just want to get the word out there. We do, we do all kinds of stuff for free. So if you want to help support us and the work that we do, I do encourage you to check out our website and make a donation through there. Uh, when we are back open again, you can come visit our McDonald farm in Naperville, or we have the Dixon Merced farm in Montgomery, uh, both really cool places to check out. At the McDonald farm, we have examples of windmills, solar panels. It's a 60 acre farm in Naperville that is working. It's an organic farm. 49 of those acres are being farmed organically um, through our Green Earth Harvest Program. So you can buy a share of the produce that is grown there um, through our CSA-like program. Um, and then you can have fresh vegetables all summer long. I think all our spring shares are sold out now, but uh, we support over 500 families a year through that farm. So it's fabulous produce. I've belonged to it for about three years now, and it, it's honestly the best CSA I've ever belonged to. So um, there, you can check that out. Um, you can also follow us on social media, find out when we're going to be doing more of these. Um, I am hoping on Thursday I will be able to do another one of these, uh, one of these webinars, um, and the focus this time will be on rain gardens and rain barrels. So uh, follow us on social media to get those more information on those, um, and then get your yard certified. So as I mentioned, give me a call if you're in Will County or if you're not in Will County, I will get you to the right person. And you can get one of those nifty little signs up in your yard as well. There we go. All right, so once again, there is my information. Um, email, easiest way to get a hold of me. I'm going to stop sharing come back and join you because I think I saw, I have, okay. So does, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. Um, I can see it in the chat. I know everybody else can't see what you ask, but I can, and I am happy to answer any more questions in the chat. Rachel, I would love to come out and check out your property. So drop me an email after this, jvbach at theconservationfoundation.org. Um, and right now I'm happy to do any kind of consultation that I can by phone. And once 
we're up and no longer socially isolating, um, I'd, I'd be happy to come out and talk with you about your property. Requirements. Oh, great question. So the requirements for certification and conservation at home, the things that I look for when I go out, I wanna see a variety of native plants. Um, I had one lady say, well, why can't I just cover my yard in coneflower? Well, you, you can, but A, that's boring. And B, that only helps like one small segment of pollinators. So I like to see a variety of native plants. And it doesn't have to be all native plants. I mean, just as long as you have several different types, um, that's great. Um, I also look to see that you're doing something with your stormwater. So you've got a rain garden, you've got a rain barrel, you're somehow dealing with the water that falls on your property. Um, and you know, you don't have your gutters tied into the storm sewers or stuff like that. Um, and then I also look for, uh, oh, uh, not overusing chemicals. So, you know, you don't have Chemlon coming out uh, every other week or something like that. Um, you're not, you know, dousing your yard in Roundup. It's, it's okay. Using, using chemicals judiciously is perfectly acceptable. I have honeysuckle in my yard that I'm trying to get rid of right now, and there is just no getting rid of it without the proper application of herbicide. So I cut the stems and then I use a paintbrush to just gently paint onto the stump um, and, and that takes care of it. If you don't, honeysuckle comes back angry. I've found areas where you cut it and then you know three years later, now instead of having one stump, you now have 10. So again, not overusing chemicals in your yard. And then I also look to see um, are you, are you, do you have other ways of, of feeding the wildlife? So do you have, uh, berry producing bushes? Uh, do you have bird feeders out? Um, just things like that. Is your yard a good habitat for wildlife? Those are the kinds of things that I look for. All right, let's see. What else do we have here? Um, how can I get the county and municipality to stop spraying for mosquitoes? Good luck with that. Um, mosquitoes are tough because, you know, they, they do carry some diseases and in some places they're really bad. Um, I do know in a lot of places you can request them not spray in your yard. Beyond that, it's really, really hard to get them to just stop spraying altogether. Um, but I do know that you can request them not to spray your yard. So you can find out, a lot of times you have to find out who they use, what service provider, whether it's Clark or whoever it is, um, and then request directly that your yard not be sprayed. Um, and, but yeah, you're right, the bats do take, uh, they do a really good job of taking care of them. Um, oh, another great question. When do you recommend doing cleanup after the winter due to the insects overwintering and native plant debris? Fantastic question. You know what? I had the same question and I asked uh, an insect expert at the Field Museum and she said you want about 15 days of 50 degree plus weather. So here in the Chicago suburbs, it's probably a little bit early yet. So we probably want to wait until a little bit later in April um, to start doing our cleanup. If you really you know, you're, you're sitting at home and you absolutely have to get out and do something, you can pile everything up, like rake up your leaves and, and the dead, cut the dead, dead stems and everything and, and just pile them up. Don't burn them, don't mulch them, anything, just kind of put them in a pile. Um, that will help to clean up your area while still allowing the insects to finish doing their thing until it was time to come out. So um, yeah, so like I said, uh, they want about 15 days of over 50 degree weather. Uh, best way to transition traditional lawn into native lawn with something like buffalo grass? Oh, another really good question. Um, so I haven't done an entire lawn yet. I will say um, we just took down, my son had had a play set up and so we'd had mulch and everything underneath it. He's gotten too old for the play set, so we took it down, but there was still that big mulch pile and things. So we just 
removed all of that, leveled it out, and I put down buffalo grass seed just to try it out and to see how it's going to work. Um, so there was nothing underneath it. There was no grass or anything. It was already bare ground. Put the buffalo grass down in those straw mats, and now we're watering it. We'll see how it goes. Um, I would think you would need to remove the sod first somehow, whether it's herbiciding it and getting rid of it. Um, I would, I would, I would probably talk with somebody like Piso or one of those rest V3, a restoration company, somebody get their recommendations. I'm not entirely certain how you would do an entire lawn, but Buffalo grass, I, because I forgot to mention it, buffalo grass is fantastic and I'm really excited. It, it only grows about 18 inches tall ever. Um, so sometimes they'll call it no mow because you can get away with mowing it like twice a year. So rather than those weekly mowings that we have to do in the summertime, you can get away with mowing it maybe twice a year because it just does not grow that tall at all. And it looks almost indistinguishable from um, Kentucky bluegrass. So it's super cool. Apparently it used to be used all the time, but it got to be hard to hard to get or something. I don't know. I'm not sure why. So uh, let's see. All right. Any other questions from anybody? Can you seed buffalo grass in an acre of patchy lawn? Um, I'm, I, I, again, I'm not really sure about that. Um, I need, I need to talk to, I need to talk to some landscape companies and find out their recommendations for it. I just haven't had that much experience with it. Um, my, my gut reaction would be to say no, because I think the grass might outcompete the buffalo grass. So I think you really want to grass first before you try putting in the buffalo grass, because I think it would just get outcompeted otherwise. Any other questions? Check the chat over here. Going once, going twice. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining me today. Oh, are you planning on having a plant sale? Yes. Our, we are still going to go ahead with our plant sale. I believe we are going to be going to a pre-sale model instead of one where you can just come and browse the aisles, unfortunately. Um, and I'm sad because I love plant sales. I love walking up and down the aisles and looking at all of the wonderful native plants and I can never get out of there without buying way too many plants. Um, but so yes, our pre-sale will be at the McDonald farm. Um, more information on that will be forthcoming. If you're on our mailing list already, there will be more information. Otherwise, like I said, follow us on social media. All the information will be there as well. Um, we were already doing a pre-sale on shrubs and trees. So um, I, I think all of, all of our plants are just going to be through that pre-sale now. So um, again, if there is anything I can do to help any of you, you've got my email. Um, please feel free to drop me an email anytime. I would love to help you out with any of this. Uh, if you want a rain barrel, we do sell them. You can go to our website and there is a link for rain barrels on our website. They are 60 bucks a piece and for another $5, they will deliver it to your doorstep. Um, at least here in Northern Illinois. Um, I'm not sure what shipping charges would be elsewhere, but I know they ship all over the country, including out to California. Uh, you can see some of their rain barrels in one of last season's episodes of Walking Dead. It was super cool. Um, but yeah, you can get rain barrels through our website. Just place the order on there. It could not be easier. And it also helps to support the Conservation Foundation too. We do get a little bit of a kickback um, from orders that are placed there. So um, thank you again. Thank you all for coming out. Hope to talk to all of you soon. Everybody stay home, stay safe. See you later. Bye.